evening, everyone. Before we begin, will someone open us with a word of prayer, please? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this uh, time of study. Father, we, as we commit this time of study into their hands, we pray that whatever we learn today, we'll be able to retain whatever we learn and apply the same in our lives, Father. We also pray for a blessing upon all our faculty members and all the students here. In uh, Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, so just a reminder uh, about your exam. I, I haven't checked to see how many of you have done it, but if you haven't yet done it, you have till the end of Monday. Uh, for those who did it, was everything okay? Do you have any issues? Okay, we'll talk more about it maybe on Monday once everyone, or on the next Thursday once everyone has finished it. Um, also, on Monday, our classes will be online, right, for all the in-person students. Uh, Monday class will be online, so you all can just join on Google Classroom. Um, okay, let's begin. Uh, we are quite behind in this class, so I'm going to try and catch up on as much as we can do um, over the next few weeks. Okay, so we uh, finished with the Gospels and Acts, and now we're going into uh, the Epistles. Um, now, a majority of the epistles we know are written by Paul, and so we have an introduction to Paul in our textbook, uh, just to help us understand uh, who he is and um, how he has influenced so much of the New Testament. Uh, we probably are all very familiar with a lot about Paul, but this is just uh, to give us some perspective into uh, the letters. So. Um, we start with his sense of divine vocation. So uh, Paul had a clear sense of his calling. So uh, we see multiple records where he goes back to his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. And he uses that as he's testifying to people about who Jesus is. So uh, that encounter with Christ for him uh, was a very powerful encounter of uh, being a personal witness to the resurrected Christ and having a sense of uh, burden or calling to uh, share this with uh, all those who didn't know the gospel. Um, in Galatians 1-2, uh, he talks about, uh, I'll just read the verse for us, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, rather I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So he also had this sense of, all that he was sharing had come to him from Christ himself, right? Because he didn't have anyone come to him and share the gospel with him. He met Christ on the road to Damascus, and then he went uh, and he was introduced to uh, other believers and grew in his own faith. Uh, so he understood that his revelation had first come from Christ himself. And uh, so he had that confidence in everything that he was sharing, uh, that it could be trusted. It was not taught by man, but taught by God himself. Um, 1 Corinthians 9.16, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So um, that sense of feeling compelled uh, refers to having an outside pressure put on you, like recognizing that there is a need uh, that you need to respond to. Uh, so that is the way Paul felt. He had experienced God's grace so powerfully uh, that he felt that pressure that others 
need this grace and I need to be the one to take it to them. And he was willing to do whatever it took, uh, cross whatever seas he had to cross in order to take that grace to other people. Uh, another thing that comes through really powerfully in his epistles is a sense of authority. He uh, speaks to people uh, knowing that his authority comes from God. So even if he's writing, like we look at the uh, book of Romans, he's writing to believers that he has not personally met, right? But he's able to talk to them uh, with authority that comes from God. Uh, he has no fear. He has no uh, sense of like he needs to shy away from speaking the truth to people. He'll correct people. He'll rebuke people. He'll praise people uh, with uh, confidence that God has put him in this place of leadership over the church. Okay, So uh, knowing that it was something that had come from God himself. Um, his love for his converts, uh, as we're looking through the letters, we'll see this, uh, that everything he says comes from a place of love. So while he also has this sense of authority that I'm speaking as God has uh, led me to speak, he also does it in love. That balance of truth and love is there in his letters. Uh, so he, even if he's correcting people, even if he's calling out sin in the church, he's doing it from a place of love, wanting to see them stay true to Christ, wanting to see them not fall away from the faith. So it's a great example for church leaders, right? Uh, that we hold on to love and we hold on to truth. Uh, we don't let go of either one of those when we are leading people. Uh, so we're willing to address the difficult things. We're willing to call out sin. Uh, but we do it in a way that comes from a place of love. Um, his convictions. So uh, he uh, talks about, uh, we see a lot of things where he's talking about doctrine. So he has actually contributed to our understanding of the Christian doctrine in uh, a very, very big way. So because so much of the New Testament is written by him, whatever we understand about salvation, about justification, about redemption, about sanctification, all of that is what he has written down in the letters. Um, and he writes it according to the situation that he's addressing. So he's very aware of what is the issue in that church and how do I bring these doctrines out to address their situation. Um, he so from a particular problem he'll uh, arrive at universal application so writing to their situation but also uh, bringing out a doctrine that can be applied universally so in all the churches for all time um, so these are some of the examples we already talked about justification salvation grace um, and his conviction coming from a deep and direct experience with God. Um, we see also uh, Paul's willingness, 1 Corinthians 9.22b, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So what does that mean? What, uh, what does that reflect about Paul's ministry? It means that no matter what the cost, he was willing to pay the cost. On the other hand, he's talking specifically about understanding the context of the people he's serving, right? To the Jews, he became like a Jew. To the Gentiles, he became like a Gentile. Uh, that is, he didn't, uh, he didn't force the Gentiles to follow Jewish law. Neither did he force the Jews to give up on their law. He understood their context, their culture, and he presented the gospel in a way that was relevant to them. At the same time, he didn't water down the gospel. So to say that he, he didn't give up on certain truths or give up on certain principles just to make it easily acceptable for people. He held on to the truth, but 
held on to the main truths right so he he was able to separate culture from the truth and he was able to present truth in a way that was culturally relevant to his audience so that was something that uh, he recognized the difference between what is important what is necessary and what is uh, what we can be flexible with in our faith in our practice um another is uh, okay the same thing to see a genuine to have a genuine concern to see things from another person's point of view um his language and style he writes in very good greek okay and uh, he was also trained uh, in as a bible scholar right he was not trained as a public speaker but uh, in ancient times all writing was done in a style where you are convincing the people that you are uh, writing to so he uses that kind of writing which is called a rhetorical style of writing um structure of the letters we'll see there's an introduction there'll be greetings to the people he's writing to um uh, he may praise certain things that are happening in the church then he'll raise concerns about things that are not going right uh he'll write all of that in the body of the letter and then greetings and a benediction so that's a general structure for letters at that time uh we also see him going through a lot of suffering uh specifically in the book of acts we read um about all of his travels and the things that he's experienced so imprisonments beating stoning shipwrecks uh hazards from any sources both natural and human lack of food scantiness of clothing all of that were his experience as he uh went on these mission trips okay so he sacrificed a lot because of that conviction of what he was uh doing the work that he was doing the importance of it the necessity of it and a heart for the lost all of that made it uh, worth all of the sacrifice that he uh, made for the gospel so paul's epistles can be classified into uh, four uh, different categories basically uh, based on the theme of the epistle uh, so we have the soteriolo soteriological epistles uh the christological epistles the ecclesiological epistles and the eschatological epistles lots of big words but uh we look at what do each of those mean okay so the soteriological epistles focus on salvation what does it mean to be saved by jesus christ okay uh the greek word soteria uh, means salvation uh comes from the word soter which means savior um romans uh talks about justification so today depending on how much time we have we might just get an introduction to some of that uh talks about justification once for all sanctification day by day and uh sanctification in personal life in our personal lives first and second corinthians talks about salvation in the church so how does salvation impact the, the life of the church um and then galatians talks about salvation by grace not by works so galatians was a very important book in the reformation uh because talking about uh salvation that comes by grace not by the works that we do uh was one of the main things that brought the church uh, out of a works uh mentality to trusting in Christ sacrifice for salvation the christological epistles um focus on Christ the anointed one uh and emphasize the person and work of Christ so we see in philemon uh talking about how Jesus has paid the cost for our sins so you all have a uh, you all have a class in christology right have you all already done that or it's you all are doing it this semester okay so you all have probably already talked about all of this and 
gone into all of these books. Uh, but yeah, Christ the, uh, paying the price for our sins, Christ the head of the church, Christ the body of uh, the church, the body of Christ, and the humiliation of Christ in his incarnation and his subsequent exaltation. So uh, all of these come from Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Uh, as we look through those books individually, we'll be able to see how Paul brings out each of these themes about Christ in these books. Uh, the ecclesiological epistles, which uh, means uh, it focuses on the church itself, uh, taken from the Greek word ecclesia. Uh, we see 1 Timothy and Titus uh, talking about what are the qualifications required of church leaders. So if you are in a place of leadership in the church, uh, what kind of uh, requirements must be placed on leaders? How should they live their personal lives, their faith lives, their family lives, uh, and what kind of character should they have? Second Timothy uh, talks about uh, diligence and faithfulness, so continuing in our faith, uh, especially for a church that was going to face a lot of uh, apostasy, so people going away from the church, falling away from the faith. So uh, Paul writes this last letter to Timothy, and in this letter, he's encouraging him to encourage the church to stay strong in their faith so that they don't fall away uh, from the faith when temptation comes or when wrong teaching comes or when persecution comes. Then we have the eschatological epistles, uh, which is taken from the word eschatos, means last. Um, and it focuses on Christ's second coming, so the last days and the return of Christ. Uh, 1 Thessalonians talks about the second coming of Christ, and 2 Thessalonians uh, talks about false teaching regarding the second coming of Christ. So warning people about false teaching uh, regarding Christ's second coming and teaching them about what is true, what is right. Uh, so this focuses on the end times, basically. Uh, with that, we can go into the book of Romans. Um, so some background on the book of Romans. Uh, we see in Acts 19.21 that Paul had planned to go to uh, to visit Rome. Uh, if, we, if someone can just read Acts 19.21 for us. Acts 19.21, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So we see right here um, Paul having that uh, sense of calling and purpose of I want to go to Rome, I want to go preach the gospel in Rome. Uh, but if we read Romans 1.13, uh, Paul says that he has not yet, he has longed to go there, but he has not yet been able to go. So that's about 10 years later than this verse that we read in Acts 19. So for 10 years, he had not yet been able to go to Rome. Uh, but it was only after that, about three years later, so 13 years later, which we come to the end of Acts, uh, we read about Paul being imprisoned, right, at the end of Acts. Uh, for two years, he was in prison. That is when he actually reaches Rome. So uh, he goes as a prisoner to Rome, and that's when he meets with the Jewish leaders um, and starts to minister to them. Uh, so we know that... Romans is written by Paul because uh, it says so in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, uh, where Paul himself introduces himself. And he introduces himself uh, using the word douloi, which is a slave or born servant, uh, which means that he had given himself over completely to his master. Uh, he'd given up his rights, he'd given up his freedom to his master, and he would forever, for the rest of his life, be under his master's rule. 
um, this is different from other words that he could have used. So there's misthios, which is a hired servant. So someone who could at any time decide that they no longer wanted to work under their master and could leave. Uh, or dia diakonos, which is the word for deacon in English. Um, and that is someone who uh, serves prompted by love. So they are serving their master uh, from a place of love. So he hasn't used that kind of word where I'm serving you um, for the benefit of what you want, uh, of what Christ wanted from him. And he's not serving from, he is serving from a place of love, but he doesn't choose to use that word. That word was used much more for leaders in the church, right? The word deacon uh, was used for leaders in the church. Uh, rather, he uses the bond servant or slave uh, as a reference to himself. Um, and then we have at the end of Acts that this was written by his secretary, Tertius. So somebody else wrote the letter. Paul uh, narrated it, and um, Tertius wrote it down. So um, letters in the gospel, in the New Testament, are actually much, much longer than letters that were written in that time, in that culture. Usually, there would be about 87, uh, it would be uh, the length of about 87 words, letters would be. But uh, these letters are so much longer because they contained such important uh, uh, messages for the churches that they were going to. And so uh, we see this letter would have taken uh, multiple hours, Paul would have recited this letter uh, to um, to the secretary. It would have taken uh, approximately 10 to 11 hours of recitation and writing for them to actually finish writing this letter. Uh, date and location. So usually uh, it's estimated that it's between 55 to 58 AD, but uh, 57 or 58 AD is likely when uh, Romans was written. Uh, this is during the last three months of Paul's third missionary journey. So he goes on his third missionary journey. Uh, he returns to, uh, to Jerusalem, and that's when he's arrested. So he uh, writes this during those last three months while he's in Greece. Um, and this is, yes, just before he returns to Jerusalem with the offering for the poor that he's collected from all the churches. Um, and the recipients, it's uh, we see in chapter 1 itself that it's addressed to those who have been called uh, to belong to Jesus Christ in Rome. So basically written to the church in Rome. Uh, we see also personal greetings to many people. So we know from the beginning of Romans that Paul has never visited Rome. But still at the end of the book, he is writing personal greetings to several people and naming several people in the church. Uh, so he already knew a lot of people in the church, although he had never visited there. Uh, so the one possibility is that as he was doing the missionary uh, journeys, he met some of these people in other places. Um, if you all remember when we talked about Priscilla and Aquila, I don't know if we actually uh, meant if I mentioned this in class, but Priscilla and Aquila had been uh, asked to leave because of Emperor Claudius, right? All of the Jews were sent away from Rome uh, because uh, Claudius and generally the Roman government felt that uh, there was a lot of controversy being raised by the Jews. They were uh, basically causing strife between other faiths because they were talking about uh, Christ. So the Jews were sent out of Rome. And it's possible that during this time, Paul was able to meet a lot of them in his missionary journeys, which is why he knows so many of them and he's still able to name them uh, in the last chapter. Uh, so because a lot of the Jews had been sent out of Rome, uh, Paul is writing mostly to Gentile Christians because they were, the church was made up of mostly Gentile Christians at that time. Uh, Paul writes soon after Claudius's death, and um, it was after Claudius's death that Jews started to come back to the to Rome. So they started to come back to the church. So if we see in Romans, uh, we see this whole thing of uh, salvation to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. 
right judgment for the jews and for the gentiles there is this distinction being made between the jews and gentiles uh it's because the church was going through a transition right the church had become um a gentile church for a long time because the jews had left and now the jews were starting to come back after claudius's death so there were also these cultural differences these differences in how they were practicing their faith uh, that were coming to uh, were causing issues within the church and so paul is addressing that through this letter uh, even as he's talking about salvation through christ he's also saying that we are all one in christ even if we are jews whether we are gentiles or jews that salvation in christ makes us one um so if someone can just read romans 1 5 for us 5 and 6 5 the romans 1 5 and 6 sorry yeah, like romans 1 5 and 6 through whom we have received grace and uh, apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations including you who are who are called to belong to jesus christ okay thank you uh, you read both five and six right yes so uh, we see here a very clear emphasis on uh, the gentiles here so he says through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake and you also are among those gentiles who are called to belong to christ so right there we see that focus on uh, the gentile christians being emphasized uh, but we'll also later on see how he is distinguishing between jew and gentile um, one example here is romans 1 16 um, it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Um, so that uh, distinction between Jews and Gentiles. So this is one of the key verses in the book of Romans, uh, talking about how salvation has come to all people. Uh, and that is what the focus of Romans is on salvation in Jesus Christ, uh, but what that salvation means for us. Um, Romans 5 1, if someone can read this for us, you can either read from here or open it in your Bible. Romans 5 1, therefore, having just been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is one of the other themes in Romans is justification. From salvation, uh, Paul moves on to what does that salvation mean for us now? It means that we have been justified in Christ. And what does justification, how does justification impact us? So keywords Christ and faith are used multiple times in Romans. Uh, and the main theme of Romans is our redemption. So in the first 11 chapters, it focuses more on the doctrine of redemption. So uh, salvation, justification, sanctification. Uh, and then on uh, verses 12 to 16, it talks about the practical. So what does it mean now that we are saved, now that we are justified? How should we live our lives as Christians? And so uh, chapters 12 to 16 will focus on the practical side of being uh, believers, being people who are saved and sanctified in Christ. Um, so everyone understands the meaning of these three words, salvation, justification, sanctification. Yes? OK. So uh, we will just go on. Unique features. Um, this is the, uh, the book of Romans is a uh, pretty complete summary of Christian doctrine. It covers uh, the very basic tenets of the Christian faith. Uh, so it's a very good uh, foundational uh, document for the church and for believers as well to understand what does it mean to be saved. Um, and we see also that Paul quoted a lot from the Old Testament, much more than he does in his other 12 letters. Uh, just goes 
going to show that the Old Testament is a key to our understanding of what it means to be saved. So to understand salvation, we go back to what has the Old Testament talked about? How do we understand our salvation in the light of that? Uh, comparison with other biblical books. In Genesis, uh, we see Abraham being the patriarch of Israel. In Romans, he is the patriarch of all who believe. So uh, we see that uh, Paul goes back to when was um, Abraham actually justified? He was not justified at the point of circumcision. He was justified when he believed uh, the promise uh, that God gave him regarding his uh, inheritance, right? That he would have children and God would bless him with an inheritance. So that is when he was declared as being righteous because of his faith. Uh, so because his faith came before circumcision, he is the father of all who believe. Uh, and so it moves from this theme in Genesis of Abraham being the father of, a of the Israelites to being the father of all who believe, uh, even Gentiles. In Galatians, uh, we see a discussion of justification by faith. Uh, it's like a shorter version of what Romans talks about. So Romans has a much more detailed description of justification. Uh, and Galatians, being a shorter book, uh, just has all of that summarized uh, into a few chapters. Um, in the book of James, uh, we see that he talks about the fruit of salvation. So Romans talks about the root of salvation, that is faith. So it is through faith that we are saved. And James talks about what is the result of that salvation. Uh, which is that we should be doing good works. Uh, so those are the three books that we can compare Romans to. Uh, so with that, we'll just begin with an outline uh, in Romans uh, till until chapter 5, uh, starting with chapter 1. So Romans chapter 1 uh, begins with just an introduction. So he's following the general structure of letters in that day. Uh, so he begins with greetings to the church, uh, begins with uh, introduction of himself, uh, and talks about what he is going to talk about in the rest of the book, uh, just to give them uh, an introduction to what his main intent is in writing the book. With that, he then goes into uh, his uh, talk on justification itself. Uh, from chapters 118 to 320, he's talking about how all people, the universal need for justification. So all people need just uh, need to be justified. Uh, verses 18 to 32, he talks about the Gentiles being guilty. Uh, chapters 2 to 3, 8, the Jews being guilty. Uh, and then goes on to uh, all the world being guilty, Three, chapter 3, verses 9 to 20. So we'll just read some of the key verses from there. If someone can read um, Romans 1.32. Romans 1.32, through they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So this is regarding the Gentiles. So the Gentiles know, uh, right? God has revealed himself to all people uh, through, even if you look at nature, uh, you will ask questions about who has created this. And uh, so that should lead people to seek God. Uh, but these people have willingly rejected God, knowing that there is a God. They've rejected him and not only rejected him, but also approved of people who walk in sin. Uh, and so these first few verses talk about how they are guilty because they have rejected God. Um, chapters 2 to 3, 8, the Jews are guilty. Um, can someone read uh, chapter 2, verse 13, and then verse 25? For it is not those. Sorry, you want to go ahead? 
Go ahead, go ahead. Ah, okay. Chapter 2, verse 13, yeah? Yes. For it, is not those, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Thank you. And verse 25, please. Uh, circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So uh, here he, uh, in these uh, two, in this chapter and into chapter three, he's talking about how the Jews also have not followed the law. And so uh, just because they have the law doesn't mean they are righteous. It's only if they have followed the law uh, that they will be declared righteous. Um, and then we'll read uh, three chapter three verse 20 someone can read that is romans chapter three verse 20 for by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin thank you so the final conclusion at the end of this section is that no one can be saved by the law. The law only helps us to see our sin, but we will never be made righteous uh, through the works of the law. And then he goes on in the following section, 321 to chapter 4, to talk about the fact that being made righteous or being justified uh, will only is only possible through faith in Christ. Uh, so uh, he talks about God's righteousness by faith. If someone can read verse chapter 3, verse 25. Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Okay. No, please, please go ahead, sister. Thank you. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith this was to show god's righteousness because in his divine uh, forbearance he had passed over former sins thank you uh, was that 325 oh. romans 325 uh, yes pastor okay um, so uh, here he talks about Jesus being the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So uh, talking about we are all guilty, uh, the Gentiles are guilty, the Jews are guilty, uh, and there is no way we can be saved by the law. But it is through faith in Christ that we are justified. Uh, so he introduces that and then goes into chapter 4, where he goes back to Abraham and David, talking about the fact that they were declared righteous and they were justified based on faith and not based on the law. Um, like we talked about, Abraham was declared righteous before he was circumcised. Uh, so it was not by the works of the law but by his faith that he was declared righteous. Um, so we'll just uh, close with Romans chapter 5. We'll continue from there on um, Monday. Um, in Romans chapter 5, is this is actually a, quite a key chapter, so I would encourage you all, or maybe we can just read it quickly. Um, if somebody can read this chapter for us, Romans chapter 5. 21 verses you yeah. can read and close with sure. Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of glory, the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. 
You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates, demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath to him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not ch charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as though the disobedience of one of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you. So um, we see this key chapter um, in the book of Romans uh, talking about how we are justified, right? It is through Christ. So Christ is the new head under which uh, all of us find ourselves. Uh, whereas before Christ, we were all under Adam's headship. Uh, and therefore, the sin of Adam was upon all of us. Now, for all who believe in Christ, we are under Christ, and the righteousness of Christ is uh, is imputed to all of us. That is, we all are declared righteous because we are under the headship of Christ. Uh, so that is the kind of key from which the rest of Romans will continue. Uh, so we'll continue from there from Monday on Monday. Um, if you have any questions, we can address that. Uh, if not, we can close. Okay. Uh, then we will see you back on Monday in the online classroom, okay, for everyone. Thank you, sister. Thank you.